So it's really an opportunity for you, the audience, to uh, ask the panel anything either to an individual speaker, but, uh, or if there are sort of general themes that are coming across from these very diverse uh, types of applications that you want to comment on or ask questions about, now's the opportunity. Hi. Uh, now this goes on for 10 minutes now, and then, uh, then we get into the, sorry. Hi, uh, Timothy Mackey. I'm with the School of Medicine. Um, I just had a question for basically anyone that's using Twitter as a data source. Recognizing that the Twitter API is limited in its sampling, uh, what other third parties are you using to uh, get a more robust sample? Uh, yes. Uh, Can you repeat the question before you start? Is it your question about the Twitter API? Is it correct? Yeah, it's a question of because the API only uh, holds so many Twitter, you know, feeds. I guess is there another sampling uh, source that you can get to get a more robust sample that's more representative of the general Twitter uh, data feed? I guess you could say. Oh well, sure. So uh, so far, as I know uh, the Twitter has. Had, uh, they actually they sell the data set. So there is some company, uh, they have some certified uh, from Twitter, and there's uh, one way you can buy the Twitter data from that company, but I guess a lot of money. And the, another, uh, there's a lot of sampling uh, method to pull the Twitter, so they call the Fire Horse or Garden Horse and, and few, but uh, for public and free, so until now we get uh, up to one to five percent, and uh, Twitter actually they change the sampling rate uh, uh, very often. Yeah. Do you want to comment? Um, yeah, I, I actually don't really have any good ideas on how to do it. Um, the one thing is, um, I know that there's another group who's doing, who's just um, sort of keeping all of the geotag tweet data. Um, but that actually does exactly the wrong thing and makes it even more sampled, so. Other questions? Uh, question for Gabriel. Yeah. Um, so when people write reviews like on Amazon or Yelp, uh, they're kind of subject to writing their reviews at the end of the extreme experience. Sorry, I'll start over. Um, when people write reviews on Amazon or Yelp, they generally have an extreme experience. You know, it was a great meal, it was a horrible meal. Uh, but with Twitter, people tend to tweet the mundane. You know, I'm going to a movie, I'm eating a meal right now. Uh, do you see an ability to use Twitter as a passive crowdsourced rating system for uh, something like perhaps a restaurant? Like if I said I went to the sushi place and it was good, you know, that's not that good. But if I said it was amazing, that means something very different. And we're building something to, uh, to do that, to provide a tangible rating. Yeah, um, I mean, that certainly seems like a, uh, a plausible idea. Um, I think the problem right now is there's just not that much good, um, like, I mean, sentiment extraction is a really big open problem. And the problem with Twitter data is always it's really hard to get anything out. So I was at a conference where um, people were trying to classify tweets into one of five languages, which had different writing systems, and they were still getting about like 70% accuracy. Um, so I think long term, yeah, there's a lot of potential for something really good like that. But like short term, I think you'd be making sort of very incremental gains. Gotcha. Thank you. Other questions? So I have a question sort of for the panel to address to the audience and is, and this is not asking, it's not about money, okay? But from an institutional point of view, what could the institution, UCSD, be doing to facilitate the various things that you're doing um, that you don't have currently? Not money, but in it, <laughs> If no one's speaking up, does that mean it's just money? I mean, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of support, in terms of encouragement, in terms of uh, outreach, linkages. Yes. Yeah. 
You're not very active on Twitter yet, I have to tell you. Uh, Question, question for James. Yeah. How could we in the Amazon, how could we in the Amazon project uh, use it, uh, the methodology developed by Gabriel uh, to use language as a tool to a historical reconstruction? Meaning, migration, for instance, could be detected through language change, no? And also, uh, and this ties back to my earlier question to Gabriel. I mean, how would that reflect the different ethnic groups in the Amazon, you know, by linguistic change and how they speak actually Spanish or Portuguese? Um, um, well, I would say that uh, for the Amazon, it would, be, it would be a little tricky, at least using uh, a platform like Twitter. I think you could use it to find out what's going on today. But um, the problems, at least again with Twitter, would be access to the technology to begin with. Um, and also, and that would sort of bias in, in some ways what we're looking at. But uh, I think that we could use uh, information like uh, through Twitter or another platform uh, to get a, a broader sense of, of how people are moving, uh, especially in the Amazon, I would say today, you could, you could really, I think, uh, aid in sort of demonstrating um, where people are moving to and sort of the expansion of urban zones and, and its link to maybe deforestation or ecological change. And also, um, like Brazil is actually one of the biggest Twitter users. Um, and so there's a lot of potential for using that. Um, something I've been trying to start on and haven't gotten too far yet is looking for, sort of like the baseline of searching for I in English, looking for common words in other languages. Uh, and so that would be a potential thing if you're looking for a word that's you know very common in Spanish or Portuguese, but not both. Um, then you might be able to get a nice map in that area of what people are using or what even indigenous languages uh, are being used where. Oh, yeah. I'd like, I'd like to come back to the question you answered about the re resources. Um, if it's not money, it's actually data itself. Um, so one of the issues that I saw on the electricity grid is that people are really hesitant to share the data because they're afraid of something coming out that's not reliable or something's coming out that's exposing information that's not, that they wanted to get exposed. Um, so I think UCSD should play a big role to indicate there's there are a lot of researchers out there that can do really good stuff with data. I mean, it's appalling that only you only got 5% out of Twitter. Twi I think there should be much more information to come out of there. So if could, UCSD could be a, play a big role in advocating that we're going to protect this data and only share the information that might be relevant uh, maybe, I don't know, for the Twitter company itself, uh, you know, s some way of creating trust, uh, because I think eventually it's the quality of data that, that matters. Yeah, yeah. And so the better the quality is, the more we can do with our analysis. So it's not money, trust and, and linkages, I guess, to get better data. So. It's interesting you, you say those, th those, you use those words, because in attempting to build communities in different spaces, Trust, openness, uh, and linkages are, are definitely the words that probably are spoken more than any other. So perhaps we can come back to that later in the day. That would be that would be really good. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I have a comment oh. or question for Raymond. I mean, you brought up that you have a problem with distribution, remote access, analysis in time, and I'm from energy physics department here at UCSD, and we are having a distributed data analysis for. Uh, LHC, Large Hadron Collider, and we transfer lots of data. We have analysis frameworks. I think I recognize the framework mm -hmm. that we use for plotting uh, graphs, and which was, I think, I think it's root that is developed at CERN. Uh, yeah, well, I must say, the research that I do, it does, this is just an application, but uh, yeah. there's lots of uh, applications where this is being used, where you look at the dynamic effect of data especially when these high data rates come in. I'm sure the collider comes even faster. Yeah, we you want to look at this dynamic effect. Half a gigabyte per second. That's right, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's, it's really like, uh, so we we're fortunate enough that we actually have an improvement in time scale, uh, but there's still issues in temporal, you know, spatial locations of sensors. Yeah, that's what I wanted to brought up, that this is a common thing that we that's come right. up in collaborations, that you have distributed data, people accessing it from everywhere, yeah. and uh, you know, having safe controlled access is yeah. important. And we yeah. have, in kind of physics, we have some of yeah. the tools. That is good. Yeah, and, and the issue is really, if you now increase the, the, the spatial scale, you get more, basically, this is done with more sensors. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? I mean, you cannot stream all the data to a central, unless you put a lot of hardware in place to do this. 
And so doing some distributed data management or parameter estimation, whatever you want to call it, is essential to get something out of the data. Yeah. Yeah. We, as I say, we know some of these things. That's good. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about it. We have one more question up there, and then we're going to have to stop, I think. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. I have a general curiosity. So, so far, all the data are limited either to the regional or language or in a, some limitation. So is there any initiative or some problem if we collect or analyze, distribute, whatever, the big data internationally in the more global setting? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't get the question. No, oh, okay. I can, can you repeat? I didn't quite get the... So my question, question is, all the big data are somehow limited in, in a regionally, like an Amazon, or language-wise, you are analyzing English, basically. But if I see the problem, like a flu, you know, SARS, etc., it's a globalized problem. Hmm. So I'm just curious whether all the research in the big data field is thinking about in the global setting, in the international standardization, or whatever initiative effort available so far. Does anyone I could try, but go ahead. I can start. Um, at least for uh, the Amazonia project, um, we're eventually planning to put everything up online. Uh, so it would be uh, as much as accessible through, you know, given the limits of copyright and things like that, uh, we'd make it as uh, available to the public as possible. Uh, we're also trying to en encourage crowdsourcing as much as possible. So from anyone in the world, we, we would eventually have sort of a division between the more scholarly part and the, uh, and the, uh, the more crowdsourced part. Um, but we're looking basically to, to make it as international as possible and to have people contribute, um, you know, whether they, they find documents or whether it's photos or, or really uh, even videos or music, um, basically any, any type of data that they can have that is related uh, to the Amazon, we, we welcome. Last comment. Oh, yes. Yeah, so uh, in terms of the Twitter data, so, so far we, we are still collecting the Twitters. Until now we have, I think we have... Uh, more than one year later, and we have some, uh, uh, we collect by sampling, and also we collect by the keyword, and we are still open for uh, analysis of Twitter data. So we have, I think we have a really big corpus. And it's so good you, for, are you getting global data, or, we, or just US data? Also, I, I think it's just for the research, sharing for the research of these things. Do we still have a minute? Go ahead, go on. Uh, so one of, I think one of the big problems too is that, so like with Twitter, you can get global data, but you're going to be interfacing with other sources that don't, that are going to be regionalized. So like in terms of mapping your locations, you know, even if you have Twitter set up for the US, I'm using census data to find out the locations. If I'm doing something in even just Mexico, for instance, since that's very easy to get data from here, um, I don't have that census data because it's all encoded differently. And so I think one of the big problems is somewhere along the line, you run into something that isn't internationalized, and that really can foul things up. Great, thank you. You want to comment on or ask questions about, now's the opportunity. Hi. Uh, now this goes on for ten minutes now, and then uh, then we get into the. Sorry. Hi, uh, Timothy Mackey. I'm with the School of Medicine. So far, I know uh, so Twitter has has uh, they actually they sell the data set. So there is some company uh, they have some certified uh, from Twitter, and there's a one way you can buy the. Twitter data from that company, but I guess a lot of money. And the, another, uh, there's a lot of sampling uh, method to pull the Twitter. Um, I just had a question for basically anyone that's using Twitter as a data source. Recognizing that the Twitter API is limited in its sampling, uh, what other third parties are you using to uh, get a more robust sample? Uh, yes. Uh, can you repeat the question before you start? Is it your question about the Twitter API, is it correct? Yeah, it's a question of because the API only uh, holds so many Twitter you know, feeds, I guess. 
is there another sampling uh, source that you can get to get a more robust sample that's more representative of the general Twitter uh, data feed, I guess you could say? Oh, well, so, uh, so uh, So it's really an opportunity for you, the audience, to uh, ask the panel anything either to an individual speaker, but, uh, or if there are sort of general themes that are coming across from these very diverse uh, types of applications that 